and we're so thankful to have you here with oh, us today. Oh, it's so, fun. Uh, nanotech, weaponizing nanotech, so it's going to be fun and scary. No, we'll have some fun with it. Super scary. <laughs> he is. It's story time with Daddy Quinn. Have you guys all heard Chris Roberts speak before? How many of you heard me up at Gurkhan when we, because, okay, so I'll apologize up front for this one. Um, why isn't it working? What did I do? Did you break? Oh, did I break it? So Gurkhan, yeah, just gone. The uh, so I did a nanotech one up at Gurkhan, and then I've done a whole bunch of research since then. But unfortunately, the powers that be, i.e., lawyers, uh, figured out what I was about to talk about. And as of what day are we on today? Saturday. As of Tuesday. Some of the new stuff I've done, I'm not allowed to talk about. But the old stuff, because Adrian thankfully recorded it last year and put it up on the internet, there's nothing they can say about it, apart from yell at me, which is what they normally do anyway. So all the new shit that I can't talk about, which involves hacking even more humans with even more stuff and being able to take over some of the blood barrier stuff, I definitely can't say anything about the fact that we've done blood barrier work. And what else am I not allowed to talk about? Oh, the um, cardiovascular system, we can now hack that. So I definitely didn't say that. Allegedly. Allegedly. Are we recording? Yes. Excellent. Evidence item number two. No, you're good. I don't care. I really don't care. All right. How's everybody doing? All right. So we're going to have a little bit of fun. Um, so part of the, the upside thing that, I, that I'm allowed to do uh, with the Acalvio guys is I get to throw the crystal ball out. I'm going to walk and this is going to rattle. I'll apologize now. I get to throw the crystal ball out a little bit further. So I'm not necessarily looking at exploits. I'm not necessarily looking at the stuff that's coming down the line in the next couple of years. Um, I will be perfectly honest. For the most part, I've kind of given up with mainstream humanity. Um, I got asked about passwords the other day, and I said I've given up with everybody. Skynet was right. Um, <laughs> and this will explain some of it. So before we start, there's always the mat. <laughs> There's the map. No, no, they're both doing it. What'd you do? <laughs> you can't blame the Mac. Hang on. The oh. <laughs> slides go inside. I unplugged it at this end. No. All right, yeah. If all those failed. All right, let's see if the... Hang on. All right, yeah, so the mandatory FBI slide, needless to say. Um, we are going to be talking about bunnies, therefore they can now turn off their recorders and they can bugger off. Nice and simple. Um, standard housekeeping slides. Um, obviously, huge shout out to uh, our two hosts in the very front here, please, very much at the end of them, make sure you give them hugs and thanks for all of us being here. Um, if you were at the IoT cookie, we had cookies, kind of, and you could have stolen them. Um, Chester and uh, a couple of the other guys for helping out, FA for helping out set it up. Um, ask questions. We're going to go through some fun stuff here. We're definitely going to go through some stuff that is not of the normal in the hacking sphere side of things. Um, and you can see the last one, hug a vet. So, on with the talk. We're going to have a little bit of fun with this one. We are going to talk about minions. Part of the reason we're going to talk about minions is several years ago, um, we stood up and did a whole bunch of other talks. And um, we want to really talk about those kind of minions. But the backstory is several years ago, we did a whole bunch of talks and series of talks and like by land, by sea, by air. And as it's well pointed out, we hacked airplanes, we hacked cars. We hacked pretty much anything that didn't move much faster than us. Uh, we hacked the Mars rover, got yelled at for that one. Um, we managed to get it to play Freddie Mercury plays God Save the Queen for about 30 seconds until they figured out what the hell we were doing. Um, we got yelled at on that one. Um, IoT, all sorts of interesting fun stuff. We got the village going off on that one. So now we decided to go after minions. And we're going to have some fun with this one, because obviously when you decide you want to go after minions and you decide you want to hack humans, there's a little bit of trial and error that's involved. Um, 
if Hollywood has anything to be believed by, this is where trial and error really ends up. This is the whole Skynet side of things, which quite honestly, if you look at where technology is taking us, there's an interesting uh, barrier that I think we've actually not just approached, but we've hit pretty well so head on at full steam when we are starting to blur the lines between what we consider reality and what the machines consider reality. Um, that is not the topic for today, but it is actually an interesting topic for anybody who really, really wants to go down that route. And obviously, we've chosen our friendly uh, cyborg friends for this one, for which it always brings up the same question. For those of you who've watched that movie, which bloody timeline are we actually now on in that movie? For those of you that remember the old stuff, yeah. We have made a lot of mistakes in some cases. But we come down to a couple of simple things when we're looking at hacking humans. There's a few different ways we can do it. We can take the mainstream route, which is endoskeletons and exoskeletons. If we take our friend Mr. Wolverine as a wonderful idea, looks cool when the claws come out, and to some degree, you're pretty well bulletproof. But I'd hate to be trying to do up my damn flies when those claws are out as well. It ain't going to be pretty. If you take the exoskill on that stuff, Nice, fun, and actually from a military standpoint, they're actually doing some pretty amazing development on those things. Um, but downside is they're cumbersome at the moment, they're a pain in the ass to get on, and when they go wrong, all the batteries are run out, all hell breaks loose. So what other options do we have when we talk about, when we talk about hacking humans? Quick slot. Obviously, you can reanimate the dead if we go back to our friends at Hollywood and we go back to some of the other stuff in history. Um, it's great, gets a little bit messy and involves lightning. Not much fun. You can steal body parts. Um, you get yelled at for doing that kind of stuff these days. Endoskeleton stuff, obviously superpowers. Exoskeleton stuff, bit of a challenge on that one as well. And then, God, this thing is, I feel like I'm going to fall through this in a second. The bonding of human and tech. We obviously now have, and have been for a few years at this stage, where we've been looking at wearable technology. You guys have heard about hacking insulin pumps. You guys have heard about the capability to stop and mess around with heart rate monitors. For those of you that haven't, do a whole bunch of research on healthcare facilities and how they're actually having to deal with near-field communications, wireless communications, and the various other things that are out there. There's some actually interesting stuff that's getting built in. Um, one of the things we were talking out in the village earlier on is the caps that they've now built that are able to actually do analysis on external brainwave. So now, talk about thought reading and talking about the ability to read thoughts. It's coming. At the moment, it's still millimetric away from the actual head, but it's getting to a stage where the further and further we go, we're actually able to measure more effectively and interpret that into something useful. Some interesting stuff on that one. So we started taking a look at what we could do to hack the humans. And thankfully, we took a good old look at Wikipedia and figured out what the hell the human body was made of. If you notice part way down here, the second one down, we've got carbon. Carbon is a very, very, very useful element when it comes to building technology. We all know it because we use it and we carry it around in our pockets. But if you start breaking it down to the molecular level, you can do some interesting stuff with it. And then if we take the logic flow about what we've done with building exoskeletons, endoskeletons, reanimating humans, and all that kind of stuff, we really want to say, OK, how do we actually improve the human that we are? We talk about putting tech inside of us. Well, why not actually build that tech as part of us? This is what we looked at. Humans are 80% carbon. Carbon nanotube transistors have been around since about 98. And in essence, if you can control or manage or inject or influence those, we are nothing more than a walking computer. And then if we actually turn around and look at human nature itself, we get hacked on a daily basis. Think about germs. Think about catching a cold. Think about getting something worse than a cold. It's nothing more than the body basically being attacked. Um, Justin and I were talking about a way to discuss this, about breaking the human body down to a network. Your cells, your blood, the flow, the network architecture, the fact that really we have three firewalls in the body. 
the barrier between the brain and the blood system, the barrier between our breathing and the blood system, the barrier between our stomachs and those systems, those are nothing more than firewalls if you really think about it. But we all managed to get germs, we managed to get snuffly noses, so how the hell did those get in and how can we use that to the best of our ability? We started taking a look at viruses fairly effectively. The ribonuclear acids, the ones that are actually sat there, those are the really core ones that get used very effectively when we talk about vaccines. Um, you look at antivirus for all its ineffectiveness, it is nothing more in some ways than a vaccine. Um, you take a look at humans and the arguably effectiveness or lack thereof of vaccines occasionally, and they all they've done is they've taken something nasty, they've made it relatively tame, and then they inject it back in. Simplify it down a bit, so can we do the same thing? And if we do, all your bugs belong to us. So how do we do this? Let's use nanotechnology. Let's take a look at the industry that's been out there for the last you know, 15, almost 20 years. And then we'll break it down in this one. What is a nano architecture? How do you build these damn things? Is this science fiction? Is this reality? How do we deploy them? It's all real building this damn stuff, but how do we actually get it to do something? And then how the hell do we communicate with it? It's at a molecular level. You can't exactly jack it into an RJ45 as much as we'd like to be able to try to sometimes. I, you've got to have this. This is my 10 seconds to actually have a drink of water. <laughs> For those of you, by the way, that want to take pictures or want to copy of the slides, hit me up afterwards. I'll make sure. Well, Adrian's videoing the damn thing for crying out loud. So you can always get it from him. But if you want to copy of the slides, hit me up afterwards. I'm pretty sure I can get a civilized version of these. So let's start with the simple questions. What is it? How the hell do you build it? How do you program the bloody things? How do you control them? And then obviously, how the hell do you deploy them? So nanotechnology. How many, you, how many of you guys are familiar with nanotech and nano architecture? All right, so we'll have a quick A and B on this kind of thing. I'm keeping it high level. So one nanometer in diameter, about the size of a couple of atoms, give or take a little bit. Um, Strength, really strong bloody things. Hardness, ridiculously hard. Thermal properties, pretty amazing. Make it hot does one thing, make it cold can do something completely different. Influence it with other kinds of electromagnetic fields, and you can get it to do some pretty amazing things, which we'll go through, which is why we're looking at using them. The nice thing about them at this day and age is we can make them into complex systems. Got some nice screenshots of it. So these are carbon nanotubes? Yes, I got some slides in a second. Look, carbon nanotubes. Growing carbon nanotubes. So the nice thing about them these days is, exactly to Frank's point, it isn't just a single molecule of a carbon, you know, a nanotech, and basically a carbon molecule. You can grow them into tubes, which, if you look at this top left-hand side, is a carbon nanotube farm. Now, back in 98, all the way to the early 2000s, building these things was very complex and pretty bloody expensive. And, as you can imagine, they're a pain in the ass to try and manage and to deal with. Well, for the last 15 plus years, we've been making it easier, cheaper, and simpler. And if you look at the size and the scale of those damn things, they're pretty small. And, if you look at the architecture as to what you can build with them, you can do some pretty interesting things. Let's separate fact from fiction on this one, which is kind of a fun thing to do. The nanobot in this realm, not the realm of science fiction, and what was that, G.I. Joe? Where the nanobot, I mean, they ate Paris, which is never a bad thing to do. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll nail a few of these. Big Hero 5 and the carbon-based nanotech, yeah, we're not quite there yet. The same thing with Honey, I Shrunk the Bloody Kids. Yeah, well, that doesn't happen quite the same way either. Transcendence was an interesting one. We're actually, what, five, ten years away from being able to upload consciousness? I think last I saw it was 20 years, and because of the advances in tech now, we're about five to ten years away from being able to potentially upload consciousness. So that really makes life interesting. And I'm looking forward to that, to be perfectly honest. Number one, I'm getting old and gray. And number two, I am so looking forward to screwing around with people. 
I mean, talk about ghost in the machine at that point in time. <laughs> so, how do we build it? Modified DNA structures on this one. So the whole concept here is you can build a carbon nanotube farm. Then you've got to actually implant them. Then you've got to actually architect and build them onto something. We've got a couple of structures and a few more slides time. What you can do and what they're actually doing now is they're adhering or adhesively adhering, whichever way you want to look at it, making the two molecules attract of carbon nanotecture, carbon nano architecture, and those nasty things like avian bird flu. So now I'm able to actually have a transport mechanism, avian bird flu, which can break the blood barrier. And I've also got carbon architecture, which can do similar things under certain circumstances. The bacterial base. So I can basically use the microorganisms that we allow into our body now as nothing more than my platform to move my architecture in and out. Same thing we do on a network. When we piggyback off of something, we're doing nothing more than using its transport and its authentication into a computer or a server to bring our payload. Exactly the same concept. And then we have the assemblies. So you can't exactly, as I said, jack an RJ45 into one of these things to actually program it and tell it what to do. But you can do some other fun things. You can actually embed programming into the carbon machines. We've got some interesting, pro uh, interesting uh, slides in the next couple of slides on this one. How far along are we? This was actually taken um, under a, uh, um, basically, as it says, EPFL's laboratory took these images from carbon machines, carbon nanotube machines. So now you're teaching the machines how to do basic math, how to do basic English, how to do basic, hmm, I don't know, assembler language. You're also teaching the machines from our standpoint to take what we consider a language and accept it in an electromagnetic frequency. So how do I go from our world into the molecular world? I embed it in a wave. It gets absorbed, it gets accepted, and now I've managed to program something. Depending upon how you build your carbon nanotube machines depends upon what you can do with them. They can be metallic, they can be attractors, they can be semiconductors. If you do a narrow band, in other words, a long thin tube of architecture, and you apply a single layer behind it, you can actually have it swim with the bloodstream. So now I have a transport mechanism. And the other thing that's useful as we were talking about, so back in the year 2000, give or take a bit, it was about $1,500 a gram for these things. They were both expensive and a royal pain in the ass to manufacture. You fast forward to now, you're looking at a couple of dollars per gram. Part of the reason for this has got nothing to do with the healthcare and medical side of the world. It's the fact that they're bonding this stuff into all sorts of other applications. We'll cover those at the end. One of the biggest ones that we tend to find more in the commercial world is in jet engines. The reason we have much more effective and much more efficient jet engines are those blades can be made lighter, thinner, smaller, and much more efficient by the application of carbon nanotubes. At a molecular level, you can now smooth out the metallurgy to make it more efficient. So we're making more of these things, and now we're starting to put them into the healthcare field. <laughs> I already took my drink while I was talking, so we'll move on. So what do we do about them? How do we encode them? How do we actually do something on these ones? Well, you do your research, no different than we do when we look at hacking anything else. The IoT village the hardware hacking side of things, all of the lock picking guys and everything else. We do our research, we do our schooling, and we figure out how to get in. In this case, we pick on either GE's nanotechnologies or some of the DNA computing companies. The nice thing about DNA, as it says on that, it has an amazing storage capacity, and you can do both molecular level and component level, so you can blend the human stuff that we need to get through those blood barriers and the electronics that we want to deliver our payloads.
But what we want to be able to do is take an easy route. So let's be perfectly honest. Rather than actually having to build an application, we'll wait for the healthcare mentality to build it for us, and then we'll just piggyback off of it and see what we can do, which is where we look at hacking the code. And there's a couple of different capable logs on it, and you guys can do the research on this one. There's a language, Verilog, which actually goes through and describes a circuit function. So we are down at circuit level. We're memory level and below. Because these things are still relatively simple, you can't exactly drop some C code into and go, ah, let's see what it can do. That shit ain't going to work. What you can do is at a component level, instruct each one of these nanotubes to be what you need it to be. Are you a capacitor? Are you an attractor? Are you the swimmer? Are you the guy with the payload? Are you the guy that's actually going to destroy or all sorts of other things? Now, the nice thing about it, I've got a couple of screenshots in this one, is that we can actually put a constraining file in place. So we can do all of the coding and the programming that we need in a language in a way that we understand some screenshots on it. Cello actually has a really, really nice way of laying this out. Again, if you are interested in this, do a little bit of research on it. It's kind of fun. Set of algorithms, Verilog text. Cello designs a circuit, draws up the circuit, and then you've got to figure out how to actually get it into something. I love this one. So here it is. This is where we take standard code that on the left-hand side we've built specific code that says hi. It parses it, it synthesizes it, it assigns the gate flow and the gate logic, and then it basically drops it into the inputs in a frequency range that the carbon nanotubes can understand. So we've taken a program on the left-hand side that says hi, carbon nano architecture, attach yourself to E. coli. It's pretty much so a simple piece of code as that. You deploy the code, you have Cello and a couple of other programs encode it, do it as a frequency range, and then you're able to actually replay that against, in this case, it wasn't inside a body, but it was against basically a test subject, I will call it for that one. Now, I've obviously built the code, I've deployed it into my test tube or my Petri dish, but I've actually got to deploy the stupid thing. This would be the nice way to do it, if it was that simple. Unfortunately, it isn't. However, that is relatively simple. Those are nanobots. Top left-hand screen, those are actual carbon nanotube architectures swimming. They've been given a set of instructions to swim up the bloodstream. And that's exactly what they're doing. As you can tell, the tail, that little flappy thing at the end of it, is acting, as we do in the natural world, as basically an oscillation machine. So you've given it a set of frequencies to oscillate at, and it moves up the tunnel. Kind of fun. On the bottom right-hand side, we gave it a set of instructions as well. Simple instructions, simple basically encoding the difference between certain chemicals. So if you look up what they're doing in the nice side of the world, they are sending certain nano in certain instances. They're actually sending these after cancer cells, which is freaking amazing as far as I'm concerned. The ability to actually pinpoint. So no longer do you have to basically dose yourself up like an atomic bomb every five minutes. You can send these little critters in, and you can do a much more pinpoint type of attack against individual cells. Now that's great if you leave the programming that way. But then you bring some bugger like me and it goes, oh, let's go after something other than cancer cells. We'll have that conversation in a minute. Let's get rid of some of the myths, although some of these have now changed courtesy of some more research I've done. Drinking tainted water won't actually make you infected with nanobots just yet, which is a good thing because they've got nanotechnology into the food system these days in a lot of the packaging, in a lot of the linings, not necessarily these kind of bottles, but the types of bottles that we use and we drink, we're now starting to pull that in. It can't yet get through the gut and the amazing amounts of weird and wonderful things that we have in our stomachs. Thankfully, that's acting as still a fairly decent barrier. Breathing impregnated air supply. 
at the time of writing, that was fairly true. That as you breathe in, obviously all the nice broccoli looking things inside the lungs acts as some really, really nice filtration systems. Unfortunately, at the moment, it's looking like we can breach some of that. We're not shrinking shit down, we're actually building it up. That's a huge difference on this one. The whole, you know, uh, Hollywood, honey, I shrunk the kids, I'm able to basically shrink a computer down. No, we're going back to the very, very basics. And we're building systems up and we're building them up a little differently. And then from a timeline standpoint, we're a long way to go, absolutely. But the fact that we've got swimming things, the fact that we can bind them to all sorts of interesting technology, and the fact that we can actually give them some fairly basic instructions, we're actually getting there. There's some fairly cool stuff that's coming in the next five to 10 years. So, where are we actually gonna go after? Well, we'll pick on healthcare, because they're always fun to break. You look at the positive side, the ability to deliver targeted drugs efficiently and effectively, focused therapies, the ability to actually do much more effective diagnostics, the ability to actually do all of basically the antimicrobial techniques. There's some pretty awesome stuff. And now the dental boys have gotten hold of it as well. To look at any kind of reconstructive, any kind of preventative, there's some pretty awesome stuff they're looking at you doing on this one. All right, pause for a second. I get to drink and I get to thank Adrian actually for recording all of this. Thank you, Mr. Adrian. Okay, back to science. <laughs> <laughs> so now we get nasty, because the cat's airplane mode's enabled. I have no clue what time it is. Now we get nasty. This is a hexymetric ring, as it says. It has six stations. So for those of you that are used, how many of you guys are used to writing viruses and trojans? And that want to admit to it in a public forum? We'll hold on to that for a second. Typically, when you have that, you have a set of building blocks. No different than if you're going to run a payload. You have a payload that goes in and says, am I breaking Windows or Linux? You have a payload that says, how am I getting in? You have a piece of the code that says, who the hell am I talking to when I've got to something interesting? And then you have a piece of it going, how the hell am I going to communicate when I find what I want? No different than when you're building this. We have our keys, the recepting binders. In other words, when I inject this into a human, is it going to accept it or is it going to reject it? Those are nothing more than my crypto keys. That's basically my certificate. Does the body allow it or not? In this case, it does. We have our transport, an RNA bacteria. In this case, I'm trying to remember what the heck it was. I think it was something nasty like avian bird flu that we took. We have our bypass tools. So the body is actually pretty effective sometimes. The immune system goes, hmm, am I going to allow you in? In this case, the ribozyme in there goes, oh, absolutely, I'm perfectly nice, I am, I'm wonderful. No different than if you're doing an attack against a company and you use port 80 to go inbound and outbound. Nobody filters on port 80 because everybody needs to get to the internet from the office. This is exactly the same concept. We have the reporting tool. Well, it's no good dropping something molecular in if you don't know what the hell's going on when you've dropped the stupid thing in. So it has the ability to communicate externally, again, in this case, using frequency modulation. We have our payload, which is the drugs. And then we basically have the decoys, which is the endomosome disruptors. So again, the body, even though the body's allowed you in past the firewall and the IDS and the IPS, to some degree, the body's still keeping track of you. You are a foreign object inside the body. So occasionally, you have to have decoys. In the world I work to, we call it deception. In the world of this work that we call it to, it's a nice end of some disruptor. So, oh, there you go, it was bird flu. So, if I put this all in English, we took bird flu. We bound it to multi, we bound it to multi world nanotubes. We told the body, ah, don't worry, it's perfectly acceptable, no problems, just let it in, it'll be perfectly happy. In this case, it was injected. We obviously have the propulsion systems. We have the ability to track where it's going. We've obviously got the decoys so that it can escape where the hell it needs to go. And in the case of being something nice, we have a drug to deliver to a cancer cell. Kind of nice, kind of altruistic, kind of a wonderful thing to do. But 
if you're somebody like us occasionally, you go, hey, if I change the frequency, and I change the frequency modulation, which means I can adjust the programming, I can send it to basically go off to red blood cells instead. So I kill all of your red blood cells in your body. Nice little thing to do. The upside of that is it's still hard to do it. The downside of it is the technology to do this costs about $100. And most of it was sitting on that table in the IoT space. It's all it takes to encode the body. This is a set that was put together back in 2013. We actually replicated and did some other stuff. This is molecular level communication. So this isn't wireless, this isn't near field, this isn't anything else. This is basically communicating, in this case, using smell molecules. So at a molecular level, you're able to encode, well, if you really want to be blunt about it, you can encode whatever the hell you want to smell. But you're encoding molecules that can be ingested, that can be put into the system for about a hundred bucks, plus the two pieces of software and a nice frequency modulator. So what do we do about it? Well, do some research. If you guys are interested in this stuff, again, this is kind of crystal ballish because we're five, ten years out to some of this stuff, but some of it, as you can see, we've had some fun with doing already. Research the institutes. Do a whole bunch of looking on this one. Take a look at the communication forms. You know, these days we're still focused on what, 80211, A, B, C, N, and P now, isn't it, I think? Uh, is there any other letters of the alphabet I've missed? G, oh God help, I forgot you, and N. Did I say N? All right, G, you're right. Look at the industries that we've done, and then start taking a look at the molecular level. Um, there's some interesting discussions going on about, you know, where IT and where IT security is going. And there's always the spaces, and there's always the tech that we do that still requires that nice rack of equipment, but at some point in time, that nice rack of equipment is going to change and we're getting down to the molecular level, which is where we start to see changes as humans. Do some research on that. It's a fun little field to mess with. Obviously, have some fun at GE's expense. Um, I do on a regular basis. I have a nice little stack of cease and desist letters from them. <laughs> Nanotech and food and agriculture. So this is the list of where agriculture, food, and supplements are going or have gone. So again, this is not the stuff of science fiction. This is the stuff of science fact. The ability to basically, in agriculture, instead of spraying the living heck out of the land, to deploy it at a molecular level to adjust the code inside the plant. So this is no different than our wonderful friends at Monsanto and others do at that level. Now, we all know how wonderfully we feel towards those guys. You think of the shit they're going to do with this. Not that I'm advocating to burn the building down, but I'm about one step away from it. The food processing. Milk, in its normal, natural form, should not be able to sit in a fridge for several weeks. Vegetables should not be able to sit out there for several weeks without rotting. We're getting to the stage now we start adjusting at this at the molecular level, your milk's going to last for bloody 12 months for crying out loud, let alone the fact that the packaging that has it has this molecular architecture and so there's all sorts of interesting stuff here. I'm not sure I like much of it. And then the supplements. There's some positive stuff to that. The ability to actually ingest something that is much more targeted. Obviously, research. Most of the stuff that was done here was done independently. I have worked with a number of the institutes and a number of the basically facilities as we've gone through this to go, hey, have you thought about this? And they went, oh shit, we didn't think about that. Help more and more of these guys actually figure out what the hell we're doing. Easy enough to do. How are we doing time-wise? A couple more minutes. Oh, awesome, cool, yay. So from the standpoint of what can we do, obviously... If you guys are interested in this, start communicating, start researching, start putting your own papers together and start getting up on stage and saying, here's what I'm working on at the moment. Take a different tact, go mess around in the ag industry, go mess around in the food industry. Can you not play with that, please? It's driving me nuts. Thank you. 
What does it mean from the human standpoint? Well, if those goes well, it's great. There's a whole bunch of research into Alzheimer's. There's a whole bunch of research into all sorts of other biomechanical issues that we as humans manage to suffer. And this should help. If it doesn't go quite so well, it's going to be a bit of a mess. Technology, let's face it, hasn't exactly had an easy start in many different disciplines, IoT being the latest uh, victim, shall we say. What I like about it very much, though, is that IT itself has definitely managing to cross the domains. I mean, it started off as it was just the computer guys, and then we started building it into all sorts of other domains. It's been built into science very, very effectively. It's been used by chemists and, and the biologists, but now we're building the architecture directly into their sciences. So there's some fun stuff there. So what do we do? Communicate. Effective communication. Um, collaborate is also another good thing. I'll be honest, I'm not the best at collaborating, as some people are very happy to attest to. Um, I am the person that will regularly throw the Molotov cocktail at somebody that I'm not overly happy with, rather than sit down in the boardroom. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But I would actively tell you to communicate on this stuff. And then look at any alternatives. You know, all I've done here really is basically sit down and say, hey, this is where some of the challenges are. There's some great stuff coming up here, but there's some challenges. Great, find a fix for it. Do you build some kind of vaccination architecture? Do you think some kind of deceptive tech in it? And then how do we address it? How do we actually communicate with more and more of the research facilities? Again, get engaged. How do we educate them? How do we work with them? Or do we just hack the human and see what happens? Because obviously, that is always the fun part. So this is actually a construct that somebody is putting together for how to actually build the nanotube architectures. Um, one of the interesting stuff they're looking at doing is gallstones and various other things. So you build these things into a swarm technology. You have ones which guide. You have ones which manipulate. And then there are ones that they're building that have frequency generators. So as it gets closer to its target, it's able to generate the frequency to break up the damn gallstone. Some pretty cool stuff. But again, if it can break a gallstone, it can do all sorts of other nasty, nefarious things in the body if somebody like me gets hold of the code. Oh, I mean, it's great. I mean, the upside of this stuff is phenomenal. But my biggest challenge is like a lot of other stuff that we seem to have done in the last, what, 20, 30 years, we've been messing extensively with computers, is we tend, it feels, again, like we're charging in blindly. We're looking at the positive stuff, which isn't a problem at all, but we're tending to forget all the negative side, not necessarily negative side of it, all of the, yeah, there we go, perfect way of putting it, all the unintended, yeah which is no different than we've done with so much other stuff. I mean, the ability for insulin pumps to be carried around by people is amazing. But then the fact that we leave the bloody things wide ass open to attack is a huge unintended consequence. Until somebody goes, hey, look what I can do, and somebody goes, gadonk. Not pretty. It'd be nice not to have that happen in this instance. Because the best case is pretty freaking awesome. The ability to target. The ability to mess around with blood clots. I mean, you look at how many patients come out of surgery will then suffer or have suffered blood clots or wherever else like that. I took a nasty fall. I was in Barcelona last week. Took a nasty fall in Barcelona and managed to knock myself out for about 30 seconds. It was quite fun. Came to and there's some nice men in orange poking and prodding me to make sure I was still focusing around. I've now been told I'm not allowed to bounce around. There's some weird shit going on up here. So it'd be nice to actually get whopped with one of these things and go, woohoo, I'm all good. But at the same time, knowing me, I'd be sitting there going, hey, what can I do with myself? <laughs> yeah, it ain't pretty, let's face it, it's me. Parasite removal, neuron removal, I mean, there's all sorts of crazy shit that's positive. And then you also take another step further. You know, how many of us think in 10 or 15 years' time when your telephone rings that you will actually pick it up with a hand and answer it? Or at what stage are we going to be at where it's either embedded tech or the tech has got to such a stage where it's on a lens inside our eye or it's a direct neural feed. Amazing capabilities, especially if we start looking at the ability to build it out this way. 
but the consequences of a room full of us going, hey, look at what we can do to this ship, is slightly terrifying. So how do we get ahead of this game? How do we educate and how do we get people to communicate effectively on this one? Because the worst case scenario gets really freaking nasty. Now, there are some arguments as to our current state of government as to whether something like this would be an effective change in policy, shall we say. And the fact that we all be, you know, we all sit behind skiffs. I mean, those of us that have worked in those kind of facilities is like, ah, nice big, not necessarily metal box, but we'll use, they use some nice big metal box. All the shit get left outside and the human walks inside. Well, now the human is nothing more than a walking USB stick at the end of the day. We've done research with cockroaches. We can actually store 50 gig on a cockroach. It's freaking amazing. And if you build near field communication into a cockroach and deploy them into a data center, Good luck securing that shit. Um, last time we tried it, we walked out with 450 gigs worth of data. So this is no longer science fiction. Yeah, we did pretty. We actually dropped 20 in, and we got 450 gigs worth of data out. It was like woo. -hoo. The biggest challenge for me, and this is not a U.S. centric thing. This is a very much global centric thing. Is we will weaponize this. We are amazingly good at shooting ourselves in the foot as not just a society, but as a human race, which is why part of me has given up on humans, to be perfectly honest. Because we go, hey, look at what we can do with this, and then we'll lose control of it. Because it's not like a nuclear weapon, which we also lose those things. This shit's small. You know, there's lots of them. F I don't have hair on the head, let's say. There's lots of them that fit on a human hair. We can't find nuclear weapons. How the hell are we going to keep control of this shit? Now, the interesting is, as technology gains an upper hand, there is an interesting argument to say, hmm, not a bad thing. I'd love to have those debates. Those are fun debates to have. And then we start taking a look at how our evolution goes. Where do we go? Do we now go more to a carbon-based architecture? Interesting stuff on that one. And then you start taking a look at, okay, how do we influence these things these days? We influence through temperature. We influence through electromagnetic pulse. We influence through near-field communication. So the next time you walk through a TSA bloody radar, uh, not radar, a TSA flip in the nice little um, detector, you screw yourself over because you've got carbon architectures inside you. Not a pretty sight to be. Yeah, hmm? No shit. I love my little pad downs, they're so cute. I still have my TSA pre, but every single time, almost every single time I go through a TSA, they're like, oh, you've been randomly selected. <laughs> Aww. Yay, freedom fungal. <laughs> they are fun in kilts. I've done that a few times. There are some very confused looks on their faces, bless them. <laughs> so, concluding thoughts. There is this, unfortunately, potential. It is, is really, you know, I, uh, my frustration is we sat down, Jesse and I sat down, I don't know, early, mid-2000s and went, hey, you can hack agriculture. And by the way, here's what we can do with cars. Ten years later, hacking cars is a thing. I'm like, great, well done, boys. We obviously did the same thing with planes as that's spread all over Google, for crying out loud. But before it got spread over Google, we spent five to six years trying to talk to the industry. Like many of us in the industry, how frustrated do we get that our own sphere of influence doesn't necessarily always listen to what we're trying to do them until the last moment or until shit's gone too late? That's fine when a firewall fails, but when you've got shit like this embedded inside of us, I'm not sure I want to get to a point of failure before we actually decide to do something about it. Because quite honestly, I'd rather avoid this. I don't mind if this happens. <laughs> I'm on the record for this one. So, we do have the opportunity to influence change. As a race and as a society, we have the capability to change. We've done some amazing freaking things. We've also done some dumb as a box of rock shit too. We 
as the guys standing up on stage, also have the ability to teach and to help educate and to help get people to think better than we can, for want of a better way of putting it. My job is nothing more to make sure that the people, the rugrats that are younger than me, come up better, faster and smarter than I do. And the rest of us should feel the same way. This isn't protecting the frickin' information, this is giving it to somebody else so that when I croak, somebody else can carry on the fight. It's as simple as that. Or, as it says on the last point, we do have the ability and the time to prepare for this. <laughs> so, closing slide. We do have a hell of a community. It can be a little disjointed at times and a little challenging, but use it. And the reason I say that is I run into so many individuals that go, well, my boss doesn't listen, or my CEO doesn't listen, or my CXO doesn't listen. Reach out to the community and help, and have them help you understand how to talk to people. Or, worst case scenario, we dox your CEO, he realizes how bad it is, and then he'll listen to you. It's always different ways to do it. Obviously, to our wonderful hosts, thank you very, very much for having me here despite the craziness and the fun stuff. Obviously, the Recalvio for letting me stand up on stage and cause chaos and mayhem. Um, EFF for always putting up with me. Eddie for everything. And then, obviously, um, as the last thing says, get out, go have fun, and make a damn difference. Guys, last slide. Thank you very, very, very much. <laughs> Almost last slide. Any questions from you? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Am I good for questions? I'll do questions while we line up the next person. A couple of minutes. Go for it. Um, <laughs> good question. Oh, I know exactly what. Yeah, I know exactly where you're going on that one. I haven't done the studies on it. I have done enough research to say that they are working towards being able to influence that. Yes. But at the moment, my understanding is no. Can they self-replicate, or is it manufactured on the outside? Manufactured on the outside at the moment. From a self-replication standpoint, you actually can build a nano. So there is the ability to build what's known as a, a nano factory inside. So a nano factory takes natural carbon, also takes the carbon that you can inject in. So it will take raw material, basically, and it will actually build the nanotubes. Then they're getting to a stage, they're building the technology to get to a stage where it can literally be a self-replicating system. But it takes the carbon out of it. That's in the <laughs> There's two different ways. You put carbon in, but they're also looking at seeing if they can get carbon out. Yes. There's some really freaky stuff going on, and there's still a long way doing it. It's them throwing a crystal ball down the line to see where they can take it. Yeah, but that's not there yet, to make that very, very clear. But the discussions have obviously been had, because it's, okay, if I can get something into you, not only can I, how can I get it to replicate, but also how can I get longevity out of it? I don't just want to inject you now and have something that works for a little bit. How do I have it so you literally have a continual health monitor inside of you that does nothing more than does some level of self-repair? There's a lot of discussions around it. There's a shit ton of little really cool white papers about it, but it's still very much on the theoretical side of the world. I was also just thinking of corpses that have been infected with it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's all sorts of shit that's got a bit figured out. Go for it, and then I'll come back to you. Um, have you guys had a chance to look at how some of this carbon nanotech research would now be affected by the recent improvements with CRISPR. So like now you would basically do CRISPR gene editing, you know, Walmart willy nilly, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um there has been, I haven't done much on that one to be perfectly honest. I've kind of more been focusing on this side of things because it's fun and it's interesting. Um I gotta be perfectly honest. Um, but I know, again, there's some people out there. Again, do the research. There's some, actually, there's some amazing research papers out there on this stuff. Go for it. So anything that's really, really nasty and good to self population. So if you look at the vaccines, if you look at how some of the vaccines are doing, they're taking that same technology, yes. Yeah. So there's no division inside that cell. Once it once 
it's actually there, it's there. There's no division inside the cell. So once they've basically, you know, done the petri dish creation of that, what the hell am I doing here? Once they've done the petri dish creation of that, it stays as a static, you know, one cell or one cell nano on the There's no self replication again. They're looking at what they can do and how they could do some in the future. So no, it's definitely not a scatter approach. Um, yeah, it's fairly tied. So, you know, I will build a set of carbon architectures and I will basically inject into a, nan into a, a like a flu architecture or a bird or avian or anything else along those lines. And then from that point, I then have a, a in the process, I can see how much is bound. Is it 50%, 60%, 80%, 90%? And at a percentage threshold, I know I'll just inject. So does that make sense?